Hey, this is Zach Log, the Great, and I am here what to, again tonight with my friend Nate. Salutations. And also with Travis. Hello. And uh, we are getting together tonight to continue to talk about um, Her- uh, Horatius at the Bridge uh, by Thomas Babington, Lord Macaulay. Uh, tonight we are talking about stanzas 48 through 59, and we are nearing the end of the story. Not quite there. Not quite there. Um, I guess this is the penultimate, going to be our penultimate discussion on the subject, um, to use a word I like but don't get to use often enough. Um and uh, having said that, uh, before we get started, I did want to remind you, if you liked my show, if you would like to um, support this, keep it going, uh, you can go to subscribestar.com slash Zachlog hyphen the hyphen great and um, sign up to um, uh, support it there, support me there. Um, and there are a few side benefits as well. Um, and having said that, um nate is still our uh reader for the show on this poem so uh, we will have this time we we will definitely have to give him a break when uh, on that once we're finished because he's pretty much done this whole poem so far um so yes uh stanzas 48 through 59 and let me get that up on the screen for us you guys can let me know when you see that. It's there. Okay. Go for it. Previously on Horatius at the Bridge, Sextus, the horrible bastard, has raped and caused the death of Lucretia, causing his family to be run out of Rome, the kingdom, not the Republic yet. However, Sextus raises allies from the countryside to come along and try and take Rome back. Under Lars Porcina, many, many Tuscans have come against Rome to be thwarted and defeated so far by three Romans at the bridge into the city, led by the noble Horatius. Numerous Tuscan heroes have fallen, including the mighty Aster, Lord of Luna, and here we rejoin the story. Right after our dear hero Horatius has yanked his sword from the Tuscan face. And see, he cried the welcome, fair guest that waits you here. What noble Lucamo comes next to taste our Roman cheer? But at his haughty challenge, a sullen murmur ran, mingled of wrath and shame and dread along that glittering van. There lacked not men of prowess, nor men of lordly race, for all the Truri's noblest were round the fatal place. But all the Truri's noblest felt their hearts sink to see on earth the bloody corpses, in the path of the dauntless three. And from the ghastly entrance where those bold Romans stood, all shrank like boys who unaware, ranging the woods to start a hare, come to the mouth of the dark lair, where growling low a fierce old bear lies midst bones and blood. Was none who would be foremost to lead such a dire attack, but those behind cried forward, and those before cried back. And backward now and forward wavers the deep array, and on the tossing sea of steel, to and fro the standards reel, and the victorious trumpet peal dies fitfully away. Yet one man stood for one moment, strode out before the crowd. Well known was he to all the three, and they gave him greeting loud. Now welcome, welcome Sextus. Now welcome to thy home. Why dost thou stay and turn away? Here lies the road to Rome. Thrice looked he at the city, thrice looked he at the dead, and thrice came on in fury, and thrice turned back in dread and white with fear and hatred scowled at the narrow way where wallowing in a pool of blood the bravest tuscans lay but meanwhile axe and lever had been manfully applied and now the bridge hangs tottering above the boiling tide come back come back horatius loud cried the fathers all back larcius back harmonius back ere the ruin fall 
Back darted Spurius Lartius, Herminius darted back, and as they passed beneath their feet, they felt the timbers crack. But when they turned their faces and on the farther shore saw brave Horatius stand alone, they would have crossed once more. But with a crash like thunder fell every loosened beam, and like a dam the mighty wreck lay right athwart the stream. And a long shout of triumph rose from the walls of Rome, as to the highest turret tops was splashed the yellow foam. And like a horse unbroken, when first he feels the rain, the furious river struggled hard and tossed his tawny mane, and burst the curb and bounded, rejoicing to be free, and whirling down in fierce career, battlement and plank and pier rush headlong to the sea. Alone stood brave Horatius, but constant still in mind, thrice thirty thousand foes before, and the broad flood behind. Down with whom, cried false Sextus, with a smile on his pale face. Now yield thee, cried Lars Porcina, now yield thee to our grace. Round turned he, as not deigning those craven ranks to see. Not spake he to Lars Porcina, to Sextus not spake he. But he saw on Palatines the white porch of his home, and he spake to the noble river that rolls by the towers of Rome. O oh, Tiber, Father Tiber, to whom the Romans pray, a Roman's life, a Roman's arms, take thou in charge this day. So he spake, and speaking she, the good sword by his side, and with his harness on his back, plunged headlong in the tide. Okay. Thank you, Nate. So, Travis. Would you like to get us rolling? <sighs> I so guess I, I don't have anything great to start with. Um, I'll let you start. How's that sound? Okay. A pop um, I mean, okay, so, you know, like I said, we're coming to the close of the story. We're not there yet. Um... And one thing I really like about this part, and it took me a while to catch this, uh, in uh, stanza 50, um, I think it's really funny the way it describes the situation. Um, and like, you know, no one wants to, you know, no one wants to be the one to go you know, charge at these three men who have cut down seven heroes um, and, uh, you know, including Aster. Um, and then those in the, those in the rear are like, go forward. And those up front are like back. And like, you know, they're, and they're pushing back and forth. It's like, I'm not going, you going, I'm not going. You guys want, oh, oh, you in the back. You want a piece of them here by all means, go ahead. <laughs> um, I mean, they use that exact same line, uh, in 300. Oh, really? Yeah, the Zack Snyder movie. Uh, it's like <clears throat> they're talking about how you know much ass they're kicking, and he's like, "Yep." Yeah. He's like, "The ones in the back are crying forward. The ones in the forward are crying back." And then like a spear comes out of his chest. <laughs> like, huh, mm -hmm. that's a problem. I probably want to go back too. Um, and it's also um in the previous scene said to that, it's a pretty good description of like you know, the feeling of these guys because it's like. Oh yeah, it's like you know these boys who are out hunting rabbits, and then without you know, without knowing it, they find themselves at the opening of a cave, and they hear a bear growling in there. They're like, "Oh crap! Uh, we gotta go. This is bad. This is not what we were bargaining for." Um, I, I fear don't think we want to go after that. That's a uh, bad. Well, and it, it's also kind of a picture of, you know, the army as a whole, because, you know, they were expecting, you know, through sheer numbers to you know, overwhelm the city. They thought they were chasing a rabbit. And then they um, and, you know, through a combination of, you know, good of, you know, of picking your battlefield by Horatius. And also just, you know, sheer bravery, they find themselves facing a bear. 
It's like this this wasn't what I signed up for. We we're supposed to be sacking the city and you know running out with bags full of gold at this point, not not getting cut down uh, with no chance of getting through. So was it just a sort of a sense of honor thing, you know, that they just sent one man out to meet one man? I mean, they had an, they had an army of 30,000. And they didn't just go, you know, all they had to do was march. <laughs> and they would have knocked the three men down if enough of them marched. I mean, was well, it... We talked about this last time where, it's, you know, part of it's for storytelling sake. Right. I mean, the idea you get is that the reason they stood in the particular place they were at is that it restricts the movement of people. You can only have three men wide. And so it's difficult to bring to bear the full force of a a massive army when you can only put, you know, you and two dudes on the front line. Yeah, and that was that was what Horatia said in his speech. He said, in yon straight path, in this context, narrow, in yon straight path, a thousand may well be stopped by three. Um, because of the, you know, because of the geography, like, there's just not room for, you know, this other army to, you know, bring their full weight to bear. I mean, that is actually, kind, you know, um, Nate mentioned, um, you know, the, the 300, um, and that's kind of the same idea there at Thermopylae. Uh, there's this, um, you know, there's this, you know, geograph. In in the one case, it's a bridge, and it's you know constructed. In the other case, it's you know largely a um, geographic feature. But, but like, oh, you have an army of you know, of fifty thousand, and we have you know counting everyone else like a cup, maybe two thousand on our side. Well, I guess we'll just be at this place where you can't use 99% of your army, you know, at the same time. You have a very limited, you know, you have very limited access. And, you know, that's, I mean, that's pretty basic defensive thinking. Yeah, I mean, choke points are the best or the worst, depending on which which side of it you're on. But like I said, for the story's sake, you know, it's. It's just drama. They send out the champions instead right. of... And Horatius did slaughter dozens of nameless dudes. On and on he, you know, on and on he struck. And he and his three brave companions gave not a single concern for their safety. <sighs> yeah, and I mean, and, and, and I get that, you know, the point. Um, but there is there is also the... Which I guess that was the whole point. If they can hold the bridge long enough for them to to knock it down, you know, then the sort of the battle of attrition, you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> All they need to do is hold long enough to get the bridge knocked down. Um, yeah. Whereas a lot of basically one because of greater resources, um, like the North in the civil war um i guess a lot of historians say it was it was kind of a pre-gone conclusion that germany was going to lose um just because of capacity the, right and yes exactly um but things like that so it's like numbers i mean parsler Sena kind of had you know he had the numbers for sure well, and also uh, another part of it, like this story, you know, in terms of the history, this story doesn't actually end, or the um, the fight doesn't actually end here. The siege continues, like uh, Lars Porsena's forces set up siege outside of Rome, right. and basically are intending to starve it out. Um, and if you, um, I don't know who's the primary source here. I would guess probably Herodotus or something like that. Um, but if you follow his account, um, uh, it was uh, it wasn't for several months, and it was through primarily through the um, the uh, what would be the words uh, the courage and uh, ingenuity of um, Musius that they were able to um, get the siege lifted um, because basically 
he was able to make it not just a an issue of numbers, but he was able to make it a question of a personal threat on Lars Porsena's life, uh, because uh, that is a disadvantage to having a king as opposed to a republic. Um, if you have a republic and you you know kill one of the senators, guess what? They have like fifty others or something. If you have a king and they kill your king you have a problem that needs sorted out before the your war can continue. Um, it gives you a very discernible head to cut off. To, uh, and to put that in more, uh, to put that in uh, more recent uh, cultural, uh, cultural war terms, uh, I am the leader of Gamergate, um, if you understand what that means. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, but um, one other thing I uh, I liked from this, if we come down to, to stanza 54, like, okay, the bridge is coming down um, and the, 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 the city um, and the, the people of the city are calling them back. Spurious, Larsus, and Herminius, you know, turn, turn and cross. Um, and, like, you could... Uh, it would have been easy for him to kind of, uh, it would have been easy for Babington to kind of make them look, you know, kind of lesser than Horatius, but like, you know, they turned and went and, you know, then they saw him on the other side, but like, well, I guess we got to go back and join him cause he's not here yet. But by the time they turned and saw him, the bridge was already coming down. And so he didn't, uh, he didn't make that a, uh, a spot on their courage, I guess you could say. Although yeah. he does make Horatius maybe look a little slow. <laughs> because uh, the other two uh, well, had plenty of time to turn and run. But for some reason, he's probably. Well, I mean, the reason is on Sextus after, and, you know. Well, no, the reason is that after slashed his leg open. Uh well yes that's right I forgot about that yeah that'll do it yeah like he barely turned <laughs> he barely turned you know the you know, the freaking stroke of wrath from the giant man he barely turned it away from his vitals and it sort of clipped his leg and he's like uh, he's probably feeling a little limpy right now <sighs> so how about you uh, how about you Nate uh your overall thoughts on this section. I picked the wrong time to ask. <laughs> Sorry, Pop Tarts. <clears throat> um, yeah, Sextus is a punk ass. Yes, that's. I think we can all confirm. <laughs> I mean, he like wants to walk around and be like, rrr, 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 rrr. it's like, you know, he's like, well, I've seen the example of you know half a dozen heroes and one demigod of what you should do if you want to be hardcore. But then I've also seen what happens if you're not hardcore enough. Mm, mm, mm. And I like all that uh, <laughs> all that Horatius has to say to him is talking crap. Like, hey, you, you going to come in? Come on. <laughs> come on. And then after that, he doesn't talk to anybody. He's just like, nah, piss on it. He goes and talks to the river. All right, river. <laughs> don't drink me. <laughs> He's in. I'm like... That's good. That's good. Well, and, and and also here, wait. Let me uh, round he, turn. No, round turn. Lars Porcena is like, hey man, come on, it's it's surrender <coughs> time. And he's just like, hey, you want to see him with the coolest finger a Roman has? <laughs> Which actually, if I understand correctly, would be historically accurate. Our current middle finger does. I, I think that gesture. It does go back all that way. I could be wrong. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I, I also, yeah, round turned he as not deigning those craven ranks to see. It's like, dude, you, I'm not dealing with you. You're a bunch of cowards. You know, you're not, you're not even a concern. I'm not even worried about one of you coming up to get me in the back. 
because I know none of you is man enough. <laughs> oh, what is also great is that Sextus is like, yeah, there he is. Let's go get him now that he's all alone and doesn't even have a bridge to stand on. <laughs> it's like <laughs> Horatius at the wreck. And he's right. like, let's well, get him. And then he's just like, okay, shut up. I mean, basically, after he's made three other threats of fury, you know, you know, his fury's taking him out to fight, and then he comes back, and then he does it like three times. I mean, he just, he, he doesn't have the gumption to step over the line. <laughs> Apparently, he's only combat effective against women. <sighs> I mean, uh, by the nat- by the nature of you know kingship in these times, someone not to one of his you know forebears not too not too many generations far back must have been a pretty tough must have been a tr- pretty tough fighter. Oh yeah. As as far as I understand, how these things went. Someone in his, you know, someone in his lineage not too far back must have been. Those genes did not, you know, make it to him. Well, the genes well, might well somewhat, have made it, but the training and the, uh, right. you know, the, the actual hardening didn't. Well, and it's an interesting... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, my friend was... T- at least they have a saying, and I might butcher it a little bit, but you know, uh, a man, a man. So the the grandfather rides a camel, you know. The son has a car, you know, and the one after that has a plane, you know, that oil plane, you know, because of the oil or whatever. And after that, his, you know, his grandson will ride a camel. Basically, yeah. and it's it's sort of a thing in in business too. You see family businesses; they usually last about three generations. It's like that third. Too far removed actual meat of the experience, um, and more concerned about, well, in Sextus's case, you know, raping women, um, than 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 the uh, the endeavor that they started out with. Yeah. They say that the the founder founds the business, his son expands the business, his grandson will hold the line, and his great grandson will start the decline. His great great grandson will finish the decline, and then his great 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 grandson will be a common man again. Well, and uh, you know, in in a context, we can you know kind of see that kind of thing today. Um, you know, the uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, wrote these amazing stories. Um, his one of his sons, uh, Christopher Tolkien, um, did. Uh, did, you know. Fantastic work in like assembling and publishing further matter that his father didn't quite get into, you know, a form he wanted it. And also kind of in, you know, defending his father's legacy. Christopher Tolkien is now dead, I believe. And Tolkien's grandchildren decided to sign the whole thing, decided to sign significant parts over to Amazon and let them do the Rings of Power, um, which also has been known as, uh, I've seen called, Olad Demrangs. Um <laughs> uh so you know you can you can definitely see that kind of you know progression in in various forms today uh another another one and i i kind of had the idea the quote uh let's see this is apparently in this form is from john adams i must study politics and war that my sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy my sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. Um, which, you know, it, there's, like, you can see the positive side to that, but also, you know, he's talking about his grandchildren 
but also you kind of the negative side to that is by the time we get to the great grandchildren, you know, nobody yes, knows well, how to make anything anymore. <laughs> well, and and also like studying communism and gender studies. Yeah, right. by, the time, by the time we get to the great grandchildren or perhaps great great, someone's going to be ha having to study war and politics again. Um, and so, you know, the uh, you know, cycles of generations, I guess you could uh, you could say. Well, and it's it's interesting almost how inevitable it, it is in some ways or seems um you know and it's you know i grew up on a farm you know i ended up leaving the farm you know the exodus from farming the whatever goodness there is in farming which there's a lot you know it's the allure of that other thing easier thing and in some ways the younger generation will you know, a good portion of them will go that direction, it seems. <sighs> um, by the way, Nate, are you having trouble hearing Travis sometimes? Because he's cut yeah, out a sometimes. couple... Okay. Um, yeah, he... Okay, he's... I'm wearing... I can grab my other headphones and see whether it's a headphone issue. Okay, yeah, if you want to try that. Because um, I, I didn't know whether that was my end or your end. <sighs> but um, let's see. Uh, where? <laughs> but yes, it is. It is very much the picture of you know the you know bully and coward in uh, stanza fifty seven. You know now that you know Horatius is by himself and wounded. You know down with him, says Sextus. Like hey guys, let's go get him. Um, and he's even like, I'm going to kill him now and runs down there. And he's like, yeah, everyone, mob, let's go. And, uh, you know, Lars Porsena um, is very much taking, taking the um, honorable enemy approach. And it's like, okay, time to surrender. And, uh, you know, then, yeah. um, uh, you know, Horatius says, I don't know the meaning of the word surrender. And nobody's invented dictionaries yet. Um. <laughs> hmm. He says, surrender. Boy, you sure pronounce swim weird. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a Tuscan thing? Yeah. Uh, well, but go ahead. It, so I think one of those links she sent us on different historical things around this I guess the one guy was saying that no one knows whether Horatius actually survived his swim or not. Um, yeah. But in this story, it's, you know, claimed that he did. and they Spoilers. Swarm around. What's we that? Aren't the... Spoilers. Spoilers. We aren't to that part yet. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have a whole lot else to say about this. I just... I know for a fact that if they did like one of those oversimplified history kind of animated things about this, when he turns around, like throws his shield on his back and turns around to jump in the river, I know for a fact they're going to put dick butt on there. Hundred <laughs> percent. And it's yeah. the perfect. It is honestly the perfect flavor for sort of his attitude in this. Like I said, it's. I like that brand. I like the stoic hero where he's like, I don't have to sit there and, you know, like, like he talks some trash earlier and it's great, but he doesn't have to just keep doing it to the very end. You know, he's not Deadpool or some jackass. He's just like, okay, I've, I've talked some crap in the heat of battle. The mortal enemy showed up. I, I sort of hosed him a little bit and now I just need to leave. There's nothing else I need to say other than sploosh. I, I do think if someone were... Well, I don't know what kind of armor they had and how complicated uh, you know, removing it would be. I do think if someone were to genuinely attempt this, 
if they had a way to do it quickly, like your armor is like you're leaving that behind. Um, like attempting to swim an a, a, a full river in battle armor, that seems like about as bad a plan as uh, you could come up with. Um, well, they, but they could could go back to that that leg injury, you know, that he mentioned. I mean, he may have gotten to the bank and just sort of fallen in. Uh, let's see. That's. That's but it, it does mention his sword, like. Yes, he. Um, I mean, he definitely cl- sticks the sword in. The well, okay. Or whatever. So he spake, and speaking, she had the good sword by his side, and with his harness on his back, plunged headlong in the tide. And so, yeah, you know, in this telling of the story, he is going in sword, armor, and everything, um, which, right. like I said, is probably not the best plan i don't think i've ever like you don't even you don't even want to go swimming in a full regular set of clothes if you can possibly avoid it um which now that is that that's that's dimitri martin that's who that comedian is like swimming is a strange sport because sometimes you do it for fun but sometimes you do it to not die (laughs) And I don't really, and Oops. you know, when I'm right in the middle, I might lose track and not know which is which. And then you gotta go by your, and then you gotta, you know, figure it out by your clothing. Swimming trunks. Okay, I planned this. Regular clothes. Oh no. Naked. We'll see. Uh, let's see. Nate is doing some on-the-fly research. I don't know what it is. Um, Check out what so it looks like. This is... <laughs> that's very different from what you think of as Romans. Uh, well, yeah, because our, our picture of uh, Roman armor would be legionary. from the legions. Yeah. From the imperial uh, period. This looks mostly like sort of like a... a helmet of some kind, perhaps with a bit of a conical bit on top and then like a breastplate sort of thing and practically nothing below the waist which explains why his uh, leg got ripped open um yeah like i mean they show uh romulus and remus here wearing basically the same thing like a bronze chest plate <clears throat> it's sort of like a little kettle helm kind of thing going on it's a little pot on their head with their spear and their sword and then, uh, yeah, it kind of keeps going that way. And then that's eighth. That's eighth century BC. So sixth century BC. Yeah, a little six. more complex. You got uh, some segmented armor, like coat of plate style, where it's got a a tunic with metal plates sewn onto it, or a sort of muscle cuirass. Kind of thing like they did in ancient Greece. Helmets are a little more formed. They've got a plume on it. Then you start getting into the sort of hoplite type armor. Also 6th century. And that they look like Greeks, basically. It's probably... This is probably after... This is hoplite armor. is probably later. Um, so I'm going to gather he's probably looking mostly like these dudes with like a, a sort of chest plate right through here a helmet and just a tunic under it, like bare thighs even. And then some sandals. So yeah, probably not that much to swim in. I can't imagine you end up keeping the helmet, but Uh. so yeah, not the most fun to swim in, but doable. I'd imagine. Oh, that's well, I think the okay. description is that you know, it sort of sounds like his feet are touching the ground sometimes and then not touching. Um, oh, uh, yeah, you're you're uh, in in terms of swimming. Well, I mean, it's at the oh, beginning. So am I ahead of the game again? Sorry. Y- yes, you are. No, it's okay. <laughs> we we will get there very soon. All right. All uh, right. 
Remember, remember. I did think the uh, the description of the river, you know, like a horse, was an interesting description. Um, I mean, obviously, the horse or the river didn't pick up any kind of speed or literally thrust more because the bridge hit it. But, you know, whenever something falls in like that, it sort of it gives that impression. Um, I feel like. Well, and also it, um, you well, know, you yeah. kind of have to try and, you know, picture, imagine this, but like, uh, you know, the mass of this comes down and for a little bit, it's going to like, you know, dam up the river somewhat. And right. then what, what you kind of, what, what I'm kind of pick, what I kind of picture is like, at some point the pressure builds up, you know, you know, something pops loose and the whole thing bursts and it's just, you know, uh, washes away in, you know, one in one big uh, wave. Yeah, um, it says that in 55. And like a dam, the mighty wreck lay right athwart the stream. Uh, and so it's okay. it, it did exactly that. It sort of fell in and the water started to back up behind it. And then it's like the horse unbroken. First, he feels the rain. Blah, 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 toss Tony Main and burst the curb and bounded, rejoicing to be free. So it was like, that's talking about when the the right. repile let go and the whole thing <laughs> flowed off. So yeah, it's it's not describing like the river was like, ah, damn it. It was more the, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, dang it. It's like, come on, come on, come on. Oh, yes, I'm through. All right. It, this actually reminds me a little bit of a part from um, C.S. Lewis's book, uh, Prince Caspian. Um, and yeah, it's that one. And like uh, there's this, um, you know, there's this bridge that had been built over the one river. Um, and uh, the uh, at one point, you know, the river god comes up and says, you know, break my chains. And Aslan, Aslan, you know, uh, tears down the river and the river god breaks free because of this. Um, kind of seems yeah. like the same, or like that scene in Million Dollar Baby where he like shoves a thing up inside of her nose and says, "You got thirty seconds." And so she's boxing this chick, and then all of a sudden the plug comes out, and like right after she wins, it's just like, <laughs> oh, the blood goes everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I forgot about that. <laughs> do not, honestly, do not know that one. I haven't seen it. It took me a minute. I was like. It's Clint Eastwood directed it. Yeah. It's a good it's about film. Women boxing, yeah, yeah. The end sucks. Not because it's bad, but because it's unsatisfying. You're like, <laughs> right? Damn. Yeah, it's not. It's not the happiest way to go. I, I do have to say, in terms of like, you know, one thing when I was recording this, since I did this in sections, I have to look for you know, places to, you know, do a good scene break. Um, and the end of 59 is actually a really good one for a cliffhanger. Because it's just like, you know, you know, he's wounded. He's, you know, carrying all this weight. And then he dives into the river. What's going to happen next for our hero? Um, that is an excellent, uh, an excellent scene break there. Um, and if you didn't have somebody like me in the group... <laughs> <laughs> it would have actually worked. <laughs> well, I'm kind of assuming most Horatius, people who are... The, the bridge is down. The heroes are dead. Horatius. Was, Horatius, rather than, being, rather than surrender, has dived into the current. Will he make it? Can he swim with armor and wounded leg? Find out next time on Horatius at the Bridge. <laughs> Yeah, I more or less assume anyone who's interested in it enough to, you know, uh, listen through a significant part of this has probably read the entire poem. Um, so um, it's just the whole poem is pro quite a bit for us to discuss in one session. So we're not doing so we're not covering it quite that way. <sighs> OK, well, <clears throat> Nate said a little while ago that he's that he's uh, got pretty much all he wanted he, he he felt like he had to say about this one um travis how about you 
Um, I guess the only other thing that I can see, think about right now is that, you know, that Lars Persena actually puts his voice in there um, after, you know, Horatius is there on his own. You know, now yield thee, cried Lars Persena. Now yield thee, now yield thee to our grace. Um, so Sextus wasn't the only kind of, although Sextus is kind of a taunter and Persena is more like, okay, you know, admit that we have power. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's the uh, you know, you fought the good fight, you know, and basically I I would assume his plan at that point would have been Horatius would have been a hostage, either to be you know either to be redeemed for money or used as a bargaining chip in negotiations, um, and yeah, you know, Horatius Horatius doesn't think much of that plan, so. I mean, Rome still needs Horatius. Uh, okay. Well, yeah, I think uh, I think we've covered this section pretty well. So, um, any last closing thoughts before we uh, before we sign out for tonight? I don't think so. No, not really. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, thank you both for joining me. Uh, thank everyone out there for uh, l watching and listening, and uh, God be with you. Also with you.